The guy behind the guy is heading out the door. What's next for him and what's next for the governor? Hey, everybody, it's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our panel today, stacked with troublemakers, including Charlie Style, political columnist for The Record and NorthJersey.com, Nikita Buryakov, reporter for New Jersey Monitor, and Brianna Venosi, anchor of NJ Spotlight News. We will hear from the panel in just a few minutes, but we begin today with the departure announced this week of the longest serving gubernatorial chief of staff in state history. George Helmy has held the post for almost five years, and his tenure drew praise from both sides of the aisle this week. George Helmy joins us now. Good to see you, man. Welcome. Hey, David. Great to be back with you. Thanks for having me on. So let's broach the 800-pound gorilla in the room right now. As we sit here on Friday morning, uh, the U.S. attorney is ready to hand up indictments against Bob Menendez, uh, the senior senator from the state of New Jersey. What comes to your mind immediately when you hear that? Well, look, I, I don't know anything about the indictments. I've seen just the headlines that came across as you and I were getting on. Uh, so I can't uh, give you an opinion on that because uh, I don't have the information required. But I can tell you, having had the privilege of working with Senator Menendez, that he's been a champion for New Jersey and New Jerseyans. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure he will have his day in court, uh, given our system always presumes innocence. It's, it's got to um, concern Democrats heading into fall elections and even going forward. No. Well, the good news for the fall elections is Democrats across New Jersey uh, uh, who have worked with Governor Murphy since these are legislative races uh, have a great message to run on, one of affordability, one of fisking, fi fixing our fiscal house left by the prior administration, and 22 tax cuts, including historic, historic property tax relief for New Jersey families and specifically seniors. And I think that message is going to carry uh, no matter what the news of the day is today. All right. That's a uh, story that is still developing. We will have more on that uh, here on NJ Spotlight News as we go forward. Uh, so let's get to you now. Uh, you got a couple of years left in the Murphy administration. Why now for a departure? Look, I think it's the right time, as you mentioned in the uh, in the opening. I, I, I've served longer than any chief of staff in the state's history. And, uh, you know, it's time to move on. The team is an incredible team that will carry on the legacy and see uh, forward uh, many of our unfinished priorities. Uh, and it's time for me, as you know, my boys are getting older, as you and I have discussed, Dave, and want to be a little bit more present in the family. But I won't be going too far. I'll still manage uh, many of the governor's key relationships in Trenton and Washington. And I look forward to being uh, supportive uh, of the governor and anything he does and, and make sure that I'm available for the team as we consider to push forward our agenda in Trenton. All right, we'll get some more specifics on that in a second. Uh, let me ask you about this Justice Department report on the vets' homes in New Jersey. It was pretty damning. What can you tell us about the investigation that the state ordered? When are we going to see that? Yeah, as, as I would say two things. One, just up front, I think the DOJ report, as the governor has mentioned, shows uh, that we did not live up to the standard uh, that we need to, uh, in, to care for our veterans uh, under our care. Uh, any, any human life uh, deserves the best treatment available uh, and with a specific focus on those who have served bravely our nation. Uh, and clearly, we didn't live up to that standard, and the governor has said as much. Now, we have, uh, post-COVID, uh, done a number of things, uh, including getting world-class management in, in, the, in the homes uh, and making the condition in the homes better to improve the level of care. Uh, and we continue to, uh, to look forward uh, to, to making even more progress. Just this morning, we were on. Well, with a number of key legislators to continue to find ways to improve that, uh, uh, that uh, the adequacy of the care in our homes, and we'll continue to make progress there. To, to be clear, the uh, DOJ report that says that it's still a mess over there, some of the same conditions in the report uh, persist. But what about the state's internal report or, or the uh, investigation that the state ordered? Is there any time frame for when we'll see that? Yeah, I think just 15 more seconds on the DOJ report as it relates to the veterans home. It does say it's really? ongoing and, and we take full responsibility for that. But keep in mind that since that report, since the last investigation of that report, 
Much has been done under Governor Murphy's leadership, and one of the homes got a five-star rating. Uh, as it relates to our own internal investigation, keep in mind that COVID lasted for two years. We're just barely on the back end of that. Uh, I don't think there's a time frame for that report because the governor wants it to be independent and comprehensive. All right. Uh, let me get a couple of panel questions in here. Brianna, let's start with you. Hey, George. Well, it's good to see you. Um, congrats and good luck on your next chapter. Um, I'm just curious, you know, we've done a lot of reporting on the whole judicial nomination process and having now been on the inside for several years to see how it really works, you know, where you would say the real hiccups lie. We know that there's a ton of finger pointing when it comes to how quickly the governor's office um, gets through to put nominations up, then for obviously the legislature to go through their vetting process. So I'm curious where you see uh, the biggest hiccup in it and whether or not you think this is going to linger well past the fall elections. Brianna, great to see you as well. Really important question uh, as we continue to drive forward to fill some of the vacancies and the vacancies to come uh, to ensure that the judicial system works as efficiently as possible. Yet, look, I would just say very quickly, the process is lengthy on purpose. Uh, these folks are appointed to incredibly important positions where they make decisions that impact uh, businesses and families uh, uh, every day. And so our vetting process is comprehensive and it's thoughtful to make sure that we are appointing folks who live up to the standards that we would want on the bench. Uh, the Senate has its own process that they undergo that is equally as vigorous. And, and so are there ways maybe to streamline that and do it in conjunction? You know, we look forward to continuing to work with our partners in the Senate uh, to, to streamline that. But the process just takes a long time. Uh, and I think the uh, seat in which these folks are appointed to uh, warrants uh, that kind of length and thoughtfulness to the process. And we very much value and appreciate uh, the courtesy process in the Senate and the advice and consent process in the Senate. Nikita, you got a question here? So, George, I'm wondering, you're someone that lawmakers and a lot of staffers have credited with really smoothing over the rough relationships that the administration had with Democratic legislative leaders in the first couple of years of the governor's tenure. Uh, with you leaving the administration, do you expect any of those old burrs to crop back up? Nikita, great to see you as well. I, I don't think so. Ooh. I think the team inside um, is really an exceptional team. They manage a ton of relationships. I was so uh, floored by the incredible comments by uh, senators and members of the assembly on both uh, sides of the aisle. But a lot of that is the management of the relationships that happens uh, uh, by my team. Uh, and as I said to David, I still look forward to supporting this governor and managing some of those key relationships with political and legislative allies uh, and, and those who don't disagree with us, because I think we have shown a way of disagreeing uh, and moving forward without being disagreeable and bringing a level of civility uh, back to governing. Charlie Stahl, you got a punch in the nose for this guy? No, I don't punch, but I <laughs> I, I just, um, how was it difficult it was, was it in tempering expectations of progressives, uh, uh, especially after you reached the rapprochement with the very, the administration was openly clashing with, and I mean specifically South Jersey Democrats led by George Norcross. You know, Charlie, thanks for the question. And also great to see you. I, I, I think we did a good job of staying at the table with folks and explaining the political reality and the policy reality that we could never get 100 percent of what we wanted just based on, you know, just the way a, a legislative process works and how a bill becomes a law, but also that the politics warranted uh, conversations and dialogue. And you can disagree and fight. We fought many fights and won many and lost others. Um, but being at the table, explaining your strategy and where you were trying to go, I think led us to um, led us to success in many instances, including, as you mentioned, uh, finding a way forward after that very difficult year uh, with some some of the uh, folks uh, in certain areas of the state. All right. Uh, last question before I let you go here, George. Uh, what's next for you? I mean, you say you're going to stay involved uh, with the governor's relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that sounds like a freelance job. What are you going to, what's your new day job going to be? Um, I still figuring that out, David, frankly, we are running through the tape here. Uh, as I told you, uh, uh, you know, the background here is I'm in uh, our hometown of Jersey city for the DGA policy conference, uh, that the governor has brought to Jersey city, number of calls with legislators this morning, a full day of meetings on the back end. I'm going to run through the tape, 
maybe take a, a, a day or two off uh, and uh, and figure out what's next. And, and when I do, I'll make sure that, uh, that you know. All right. Uh, rare to see a chief of staff get so much bipartisan praise. George Helmy, uh, appreciate you coming on with us, man. Good luck. David, I, I appreciate all of you. And uh, we just say out loud that I'm so thankful for all of you. We don't always agree. Um, but uh, the folks on this and the, the profession that you guys are in is essential to our democracy. And I would be remiss if, uh, as I depart here, I didn't say how grateful I am for all of you and for your colleagues. Thank you. Fair enough, man. Thanks very much. All right, panel. Uh, Charlie, Nikita, Brianna, good to see you all. Uh, Charlie, this Menendez news is just breaking, obviously. But what comes to your mind when you hear about the senior senator from New Jersey having gold bars and cash in, in pockets in his home? Um, I, I, it, it's stunning. Um, and, and it's part of a pretty colorful tawdry lore that has uh, uh, surrounded the senator from the beginning. I, I think a lot of Democrats are going to just, I think, they're not going to shrug this time. I think they're going to be there's going to be worry and a sense of fatigue that we got to go through this again. And um, I I struggle to see whether the uh, the unified support that's always been there for Menendez is going to hold. Brianna Menendez is like the cat with the nine political lives, but gold bars for him and and the misses, oi. You yeah, think this kind of, is uh, one that has the potential to stick? It's the stuff you can't make up about politicians in New Jersey. Um, I mean, listen, the allegations obviously are broad. I think the tricky thing here is that just like we saw um, six years ago in the case of Solomon Melgan, the Florida eye doctor for whom uh, Senator Menendez was accused of similar type actions, uh, accepting gifts in exchange for using his power and influence. These are tough things to prove. I mean, you have to prove that an official act was taken in exchange for using that influence. And like we saw, I feel like this was just yesterday that we were all covering that trial, which kind of gives you some chills that we're back here again. Um, but that was really difficult um, for them to prove. And of course, it ended in a mistrial. Um, and so not necessarily vindicated, but of course, um, the senator went on to win re-election. Um, of course, he is going to be running again. Uh, so these are these are tough charges to prove. And, um, you know, I imagine that with this year-long investigation and having gone through that already, um, the, you know, district attorney in New York uh, is obviously gathering quite a few witnesses, which is what we've been hearing, um, you know, on background. Nikita, uh, were you reading some of the indictment this morning? Did anything um, kind of wacky jump out at you? Am I right that there was uh, cash in pockets and and a hundred thousand dollars in gold? Somebody bars? talked to David about these gold <laughs> bars. Yeah, because I, I, don't, I don't have many details, but I know that's the that's the thing that grabs you, right? Yeah, so I can't uh, speak to the provenance of those gold bars, but according to the indictment, they found somewhere around half a million dollars just stowed away in the senator's house. Uh, some of it, you know, stacks of money in jackets in his closet, that sort of thing. Uh, the charges themselves, I'll apologize, would, the indictment came out very briefly before we came on for the show, yeah. so I haven't gotten the yeah. chance to get all the way through it. But uh, in there, I think they allegedly were paid uh, with a luxury car at some point, payments on their mortgage. Uh, it seems as though there are some pretty wide-ranging accusations uh, in this indictment this time around, for sure. The list of characters that you have to follow. Actually, Charlie, I interviewed a couple of your colleagues at The Record who did a real bang-up uh, job putting together and creating the web that is this case. Um, the number of characters that are involved and uh, the accusations around it, I mean, using influence to get a halal meat business, uh, the only certification through Egypt to be able to export halal meat. Um, you have a developer involved who's this real big wig in terms of uh, the area that Menendez, you know, those are his stomping grounds. Um, you've got a number of other folks who are quite wealthy um, who, 
you know, certainly they all run in similar circles. They're all from that uh, area, that Hudson County area that Menendez uh, lives in, it was brought up in. Um, but just keeping track of the number of folks who are uh, weaved into this indictment um, is also kind of tricky. Uh, and so I, 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 I am curious like Nikita to read through the rest of the charges. Um, we haven't had a chance to do that yet um, and to see if there are any, uh, you know, any other folks that we haven't already heard about included. Yeah, Charlie, this reminds me, uh, the allegation anyway, of finding uh, uh, stacks of cash in, in, uh, in jackets that had the senator's name on it. It reminds me of some of the real characters. I mean, Bob Januszewski, a former Hudson County executive, evidently had stacks of money in the fridge or in under floorboards. I mean, this is like classic Hudson County, no? Yeah. As I said before, it's to that, you know, um, lore, not only of Menendez, but of the culture he comes from that county. Um, I, I, one thing I'll say about it is, is that, um, you know, Menendez is a, a, a very, a, he will fight to the death. He's not going to go down easy. And one thing, um, you know, the Supreme Court has narrowed the the the, uh, the definition of bribery, has made the yeah. bar a little higher, uh, much higher to make these cases. But on the other hand, I, I think obviously the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in New York understands that. And uh, it knows the rules that they're playing with. And they uh, know that, um, that, you know, if they're going to take a, another swipe at Menendez, they better have everything buttoned down. So we're going to have to see. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, switch gears. Obviously, this story is still developing and we'll have more on NJ Spotlight News as the days go on. Uh, switching gears here a little bit. And Nikita, you had a piece on a ruling in the Daniels Law case in New Brunswick. Can you give us a quick update on that? Uh, sure. So this case centers around Charlie Cradiville. He's a editor of a local paper, paper called New Brunswick Today. Yep. Uh, the police director over in New Brunswick happens to live uh, in Cape May County, some two hours away from the Middlesex County city. And uh, Charlie asked that Daniel's Law, which is a state law enacted after the assassination or the attempted assassination, rather, of a federal judge named Esther Salas, that uh, ended with her son dead. So that law simply bars the release of addresses belonging to judges and some other law enforcement officials. Uh, Mr. Cradiville was seeking to have some temporary or limited limits imposed onto Daniel's law so that uh, he would not face criminal or civil charges for noting that their police director uh, happens to live some time away from the city. Didn't get yesterday. his address, right? Just said that he lived in Cape May, right? Correct. Uh, he, I think he presented a piece of paper or some documents that had his address to the city council, but uh, you know, it was never published. Uh, but anyway, yesterday the judge found that Daniel's law is narrowly enough tailored to meet its governmental purpose and not be unconstitutional by infringing on uh, Mr. Cradiville's freedom of speech. But the plaintiffs have already appealed, so that case is going to continue to move forward. Yeah. An important case, I think. Um, let's talk about Tom Kane Jr. Uh, he's got House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in for barbecue this week. We're all not invited. Uh, but everyone's talking about his stock portfolio. Is it right, Charlie, that he just did what he criticized Tom Malinowski for doing? Well, no, it, 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 there's clearly uh, um, a, a level of hypocrisy now. I mean, he did. Um, I, I don't think these charges by Malinowski and Kane are uh, obviously the same thing, but they went so over the par, uh, over the top with their outrage about Malinowski um, that uh, you know it, there there is an element of hypocrisy in the whole thing. There's no question; you can't really avoid it. Definitely, I agree with, with Charlie about the hypocritical nature of it all. Um, and a little nuanced, much like Tom Malinowski's situation, former congressman, in that this was a family trust that um, his father, the former governor, put together. And so, um, you know, he had no control, he says, over uh, those stock trades and wasn't 
informed about it in a timely way. If anything, this has taught me um, just how little control uh, these folks have over their money and how much trading they're doing, um, so much so that after all of that fallout, you'll remember Tom Malinowski um, you know, uh, petitioned to make sure that folks were putting their money into a blind trust, which is what he ultimately did. Brianna, almost all the mayors in Hudson County want Jim McGreevy to succeed Steve Fulop as mayor of Jersey City, even though that race is two years away. Uh, you spent some years in Hudson County. Does this mean it's Jim McGreevy, all voting aside? Usually when the Hudson County Democratic Organization uh, makes a choice, that is what we see uh, happening. We actually did a, a, a pretty lengthy piece on it this week for the newscast. And, you know, everybody's backing Jim McGreevy, but Jim McGreevy hasn't actually said anything mm -hmm about running. Um, and mind you, there are other folks, uh, James Solomon, who's a councilman in Jersey City, um, Bill O'Day, who is also running uh, for mayor. There are other folks who are pretty frustrated with that process saying, you know, it's really the voter's decision. And so the voter should be putting uh, these, these folks forward, not a party machine making that choice, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I mean, listen, when you have the county line, we have talked about this hundreds of times and you have that money and the mechanics of the machine behind you, um, that's a pretty formidable, uh, you know, battle for anyone else. So yeah. it's looking likely, but again, we have yet to hear from Jim McGreevy. Just interesting that the current sitting mayor, Steve Fullup, is already seeking the gubernatorial nomination. So it would be um, sort of ironic if a former governor then takes the seat of the Jersey City mayor. A little bit of yeah. a swap there. Just a, a P.S. to that uh, whole question of uh, McGreevy and Fulop. You know, they used to be buddies and then they weren't buddies. But we talked to Fulop on uh, Chatbox this week and he said that they had talked recently and that there was a thaw in the coolness in the relationship, which I thought was uh, pretty significant to hear from uh, from Steve Fulop. Anyway, Nikita, you had a piece on prospects for Jersey moving on uh, electric vehicles. Not so much, right? Uh, so th it's gotten a mixed reception so far. Uh, this is, you're talking about the Advanced Clean Cars 2 initiative, which effectively would just phase out, or phase down, I should say, the number of uh, internal combustion engine cars uh, on sale at the market. By 2035, that number would be brought down to zero. Um, obviously, environmentalists love this. They think this is going to be great for the environment. They say these cars are cheaper to own than uh, their gas burning counterparts. Uh, but other folks, uh, like fossil fuel lobbies, they say, you know, we're not ready for this. We don't have the infrastructure. Uh, even car manufacturers or car dealerships are saying the chargers simply aren't there. The energy capacity in our, in our grid simply isn't there. Uh, but it's moving along. A couple of other states, have, or a few other states have done this, and I imagine New Jersey probably is going to follow suit just based on uh, how the process has gone so far. All right. Real quick roundtable as we head to the finish line here. Uh, fall elections. Um, that's the next election we're going to have to be uh, thinking about and reporting on. Charlie, what should, what should people be looking for in the fall elections? Well, uh, I, I I think you're going to see um, a lot of an attempt by Republicans um, who uh, to to kind of uh, uh, take advantage of issues such as um, concerns over LGBTQ curriculum, sex ed curriculum, whales, and as Nikita just mentioned, the whole um, pushback on uh, on electric vehicles. Yeah. Don't and I think that's going to be one big and gas stoves. Thank you. Uh, I have an electric stove, but you you put this all into one combustible, um, you know, uh, mix, and it's uh, they think that that there's that can foment into a backlash. I think the Democrats are going to push back on uh, and and reprise the issue of abortion as a signifier of extremism, and they're going to try to. Uh, muzzle any kind of discontent with generous rebates with checks coming out before yeah. the election. 
Brianna, so launch your how, bank accounts. Brianna, how much of uh, Menendez is going to be a part of this? Ten seconds. Yeah, I mean, he's right, already got a challenger, right? The mayor, former mayor of, of Mendham. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in Burrow, terms she's... of the fall elections, do you think that uh, Republicans will make some hay out of the Menendez indictment? Yeah, I mean, if if they were at the top of the ticket, I would say maybe. But generally, I, uh, I, I don't think that's going to have a, too much of an effect on local legislators. All right. And that's Roundtable for this week. Charlie, Nikita, Brianna, good to see you all. Thanks also to George Helmy for joining us. You can follow the show on Twitter or X at Roundtable NJ and get more exclusive content, including full episodes, when you scan the QR code on your screen. I'm David Cruz for all the crew here in downtown Newark. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine. The magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.